Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and delighted to have in studio Dr. Larry Crabb, author of the newly released book, When God's Ways Make No Sense. Dr. Crabb is a well-known psychologist, conference and seminar speaker, Bible teacher, popular author, and founder and director of New Way Ministries. He's currently scholar in residence at Colorado Christian University in Denver and a visiting professor of spiritual formation for Richmond Graduate University in Atlanta. Dr. Crabb and his wife Rachel live in Charlotte, North Carolina, and you can find more information about them and their ministry at newwayministries.org. Here to discuss his latest book, When God's Ways Make No Sense, Dr. Larry Crabb. Dr. Crabb, welcome to the program. My privilege. Thank you for having me. Uh, Dr. Crabb, your career started out in clinical psychology. And in uh, the year 2002, there was a real shift for you into embracing a uh, less clinical psychological model of using the Freudian methods, the um, Jungian methods, and looking to the Bible looking to some, even to some of the writings, and I was impressed that some of the teachings that you receive were from some of the Catholic scholars. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think we uh, tend to paint the Catholic Church with a brush that maybe is a little bit too broad. Um, I have a little bit of a grudge, their complicity in the Holocaust, so I have a little bit of a hard time Understood. coming alongside of it, but I know many spirit-filled Catholics who are completely different than what I would have stereotypically. But one of the things I noticed was is that your approach to everything was now the fullness of God. It was Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The entirety of Scripture presented to us by one author in one book which goes against the grain of 66 books, 41 authors, and the segmentation of and separation that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit do not operate in perfect unity, that they are actually three separate persons. And as a Jew, uh, a Deuteronomy 6.4 mm -hmm. Jew, <laughs> Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, one the Lord God. is one, um, three and one came in a can about this big. <laughs> it said three and one on it, had a little red cap, and I think you probably used it to lubricate your bicycle <laughs> the same way I did. I hear you. So this concept of three and one, uh, from a clinical psychologist standpoint, is almost, uh, what, multiple personality disorder? Or, or just plain silly. F foolishness really yeah. is what uh, King Solomon That's right. uh, says it's, it's just all foolishness. So when you came to this realization that true healing, true holistic uh, approach to psychology was not from a clinical perspective, but it was from a God-centered perspective, that changed everything about your view of psychology. Absolutely. It made me realize that if God has spoken, and I believe He has, in what I like to call the 66, 66 love letters that He's written to us, if God really has spoken, and I believe He has, then the best thing we can do is listen. Because if He is the good God that He claims to be, the loving God that is demonstrated fully on the cross, if all that's true, if God's omnipotent, He's powerful, and all the typical words that we use, He's sovereign, He's loving, He's just, He's merciful, if He's all of that, then I can't imagine, if He's also brilliant, then I can't imagine why we wouldn't listen to Him as our final authority. And rather than integrating psychology and Christianity, how about starting with Christianity as revealed in what God has said, and if psychological theory and research and all can perhaps embellish a thought or two, maybe I have no problem with that, but I don't want to integrate the two because when you integrate the two, you lose something of both. And I don't want to lose anything of Christianity, but I'm willing to lose quite a bit of psychology, although there's some parts that I'm willing to be provoked by and it can be catalytic in my thinking, but I want it to be what God has said. So then when I got really, really caught up in this and just wanting to be a, a, a Christian who talks to people, 
And I didn't care whether you call me a psychotherapist or a counselor or a spiritual director or a life coach. All I wanted was to have conversations that matter. I was so drawn to Philippians 1.10 when Paul says he's in prison under house arrest and he's talking to his friends. If I were in prison talking to my friends, I'd say, get me a good lawyer. What he says is, I want you to know what really matters. And what really matters is you live out the fruit of all that Jesus had made possible in your life. Well, that's just ethereal religious stuff for Sunday mornings, or maybe it's not. Maybe it's the kind of conversation I want to have with myself, with my wife, with clients, with friends, whomever. That's what I want. But then when I start listening to God, I realize that Isaiah 55, 8 is kind of the theme book, the theme, theme verse behind this book, when he says, my ways are much higher than yours. My ways and my thoughts are so different than yours, you can't even imagine it. In other words, you're going to have to depend not on your own mental capacity, but you're going to have to use the intelligence I've given you to hear what I'm saying, and even when it doesn't make a lot of sense, realize that you're too stupid to tell me what makes sense. And I make sense all the time, but not according to your terms. And that, but that kind of thinking that I want to listen to God, I want to hear what He's saying, but I realize that some of His, the way He operates, the way He moves, initially doesn't excite me a lot. So what's wrong with me? Not what's wrong with Him, what's wrong with me? And all that was kind of the soil that was plowed up for this book. You know, it's, it's interesting when you say that because we make this declaration, okay? Lord, your ways are not our ways and your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. As if we are taking the defeatist attitude that I should not pursue. Okay. Ah. And yeah. I pray every day. And um, it's recorded because we record my teaching, my weekly nighttime teachings are recorded and then they're replayed at the nine o'clock hour, where I pray, Lord, bind my mind to your mind, ah. bind my heart to your heart, bind my will to your will, bind your spirit to my spirit, that you and I might be one. That I want the mind of Messiah. Just because your ways are not my ways and your thoughts are higher than my thoughts, I need to get a bigger ladder. That's the challenge to me is that not that it's unobtainable, but that I should be seeking the higher things. Paul gave that admonition. Yes. He said, listen, just because of speaking tongues, you know, he said, look, it's, it's best to seek after the higher, oh, yeah. higher gifts. Just because you don't have it doesn't mean you should give up seeking Set after it. Set your mind on things above. Right. So I took it as a challenge mm. to me saying, okay, Great, your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. I want higher thoughts. Yeah. Okay, I, I I don't want to be trapped. I I want that. And instead of this this from the pulpit, this declaration of of uh, uh, we read an obituary, we get a diagnosis, we have a a thing. Well, you know that's God, and yeah. His ways are not our ways, and His thoughts as if it's a defeat. That's fatalism. I, I want to obtain that, and not that I can, and Paul says this, not that I have accomplished all this, but this, my friends, I do. I'm after it. All right? I'm almost 67 years old. People say to me, do you remember a couple of years ago? And I go, no, I don't. <laughs> okay? And they say, well, are you losing your short-term memory? I say, no, I'm not. I choose not to hold on. My daughter reminds me all the time. She says, Dad, don't you remember? And I go, no. If it's negative, I don't want to live in the past. Okay? If it's positive, I want to harvest it, and it becomes part of my treasure. But if it's a part of my past, I want, no, I don't. Oh, yeah, oh yes, you, you remember. You, I said, you know what? If I do, I choose not to. <laughs> All right? Because what benefit will, be, will it be to me to reach back into a bag of mush when I'm seeking after the higher things of God. Pressing forward. So when God's ways make no sense, we're not supposed to just throw our feet and our hands up in the air in defeat. You're telling us in this book that there are the lives of three, Jonah, Saul, and Habakkuk, that uh, uh, faced daunting circumstances, but one brought about the only nation in the Bible to be saved. Mm -hmm. The next nation will be Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, Saul, who was 
classical, uh, clinically, psychologically, classical, uh, mm. not even seeking after a biblical worldview in any way, shape, or form. He knew what he wanted and he was going after it in right. his own way. Yeah. And, and Habakkuk, who stood there watching all this unfold, but just trusted, just faithfully trusted. So as we look at the book, you start out by saying God's way of thinking doesn't easily fit into our minds. It sure doesn't. And therefore, we have to, I love the point that you're making, rather than saying it doesn't fit into our minds, therefore I'm not going to bother with it, I'll just move along and see if I can make my life work in some form, as opposed to saying, if his ways make no sense, it's a challenge to my redeemed mind to actually seek out some understanding, whatever understanding the Bible provides, I want to know it, and I want to be eager about it, as opposed to fatalistically resigned to not knowing, because we can know some things, we can't know all things, but we can know enough because we have the Bible and we have the Spirit to enlighten and force. We can know enough to, in the middle of our circumstances, when God's ways are not making sense, to think really hard, prayerfully meditate, talking to good people about it, and coming up with some understanding that God is really doing something good. The question, and one of the key questions that I, I, I put in the book, is every, every born-again believer believes that God is good in the sense, obviously, that Jesus died for our sins and when we die we're going to go to heaven. Well, that's good news. We all agree that's good news. But how about in this life? How about when disease hits, when problems happen? And the question that I've asked in this book is, so what good is God in this life? And I believe the answer is, well, unbelievably good, but we don't see it that way. So let's sharpen our minds until we can agree with Him that he's always doing us good. Where does he say that in the Old Testament? Jeremiah, I'm always doing my people good. I think it was Isaiah, I forget. But I'm always doing my people good. So how is he doing me good when life falls apart? And rather than saying, well, I guess it's some way, I don't know, and then just getting on with my life, that's a terrible mistake to make. And I want to know how Jonah, when he faced the, some ways of God with him that he didn't like, he decided to resist God and run away. Now that's a miserable mistake, but I think Christians tend to do that. And I think without looking to God and saying, God, what are you up to? We're resisting this God and just running into however we can manage our lives, and we miss out on Christianity. And then Saul, before he became Paul, he distorted all that he knew of the Old Testament. He ignored it, Isaiah 53 and a lot of other passages, apparently. He actually knew them. He was a trained scholar from Gamaliel and leading Pharisee of the day. But he, what he understood was something that fit his own agenda. So he distorted what the Bible says and denied any passages in Scripture that contradicted his understanding. And I think that's the, if there's one central struggle in Christianity today, Western Christianity, I think it's that. When I don't know what God is doing, I'm going to change the gospel. Galatians 1, a whole different gospel. I'm going to change the gospel into something that better fits my way of understanding things. And that's a terrible mistake because my way of understanding things doesn't align with God's naturally. So then you have Habakkuk who comes along and he didn't much like what God was saying. You're going to use a more wicked nation, Babylon, to destroy your people who are your chosen people? God, you make no sense. What did he do in the middle of that? He climbed up in a tower. I think to get away from looking at the mess and was saying, can I ask you what you're doing, God? I really want to know your point. I really want to know what you're doing. And God said, well, I'm going to tell you. And his response to it is, you know, in the last chapter in Habakkuk, and Hab Habakkuk, however you pronounce it, I've often said Habakkuk, so maybe I'll go with that for the time. But in the end of the chapter, in the end of that little tiny short prophecy of his, the thing that really inspired this book was he trembled over what God was doing because it didn't fit his understanding of what was best. But he trusted that whatever God is doing is best. And he's saying, what I don't understand, I will trust that when you give me more wisdom and more knowledge, I'll be able to say, if not today, then tomorrow, you do all things well, and I trust you to be the God you claim to be. We go to church on Sunday. We expect to hear a message on salvation. Designed that way, purposeful, the one time where the gospel gets presented in a expected, clear, concise, you go there expecting and you invite a friend mm -hmm. expecting them to hear the gospel. Right. Uh, but if God's ways are going to make sense to us, then we have to be like Paul who said, when I was a child, 
I thought like a child. I spoke like a child. I acted like a child. But now I'm no longer a child. Now I see partly. Mm. This moving to the partly means that God's plans now being revealed to him, and he's imprisoned, and he is yet the apostle. Mm -hmm. uh, he's actually the father of distance learning. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. <laughs> All right, because I never put it that way, but that makes you know, sense. You know, he sends a letter. A bunch of people yeah. gather around, read sure, it. They right, study right, it. Right, right. Okay, they respond to him. He ans important answers them questions. Answers their yeah. responses. Sure. All right. Uh, some things in there that we've taken out of context because we've applied a 21st century mind. I think mm -hmm. one of the very first things I learned uh, was that I should not, as, as, as I became a believer, do not forsake my Hebrew mind, for my Hebrew mind is an ancient one, mm -hmm. and I read the Bible in context. So yes. if it's the first century, I read it in the first century context. If it's in 587, B.C., I read it in 587 B.C. Mm -hmm. I don't read it in 2018. Yeah. And so that was one of the best piece of advices yeah. I ever received yeah. was don't lose my Hebrew con contextual view because I can't understand some of these things in a modern context. But have we made it so that we have to seek out outside sources because the third leg, the Holy Spirit, is not discussed in the predominance, in the major denominations of Christianity. Mm -hmm. And without it, can God's ways ever make sense to us? Yeah, could, absolutely not. Could it have made sense to Jonah? Because who was it that led Jonah back? the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Who was it that led Paul? Right? He had an encounter with Jesus. Right? He's blinded. He's led along the way. But who is there in prison with him? From the earliest parts of the Bible all the way to the present. And then we look at Habakkuk, who's, who's standing there, and he ascends and my view has always been so he could see it more clearly from God's perspective than he could from his own yeah. eye level and perspective. Get into the larger story that God is telling as opposed to the smaller story that's driving us nuts. Right. So when we look at when God's ways make no sense and you give us in the book a deeper understanding, you also are consistent hmm. in the fact that you reinsert the Holy Spirit back into the picture because without it, not only God's ways don't make sense now, God's ways can't ever make sense. And you will live a distorted view of Christianity. It will be like your father's definition of your grandfather's condition. Mm. And that really sums up where a lot of Christians are if it really is true. Yeah, yeah. And the doubts come in because God's ways don't seem to fit our agenda for what a good and loving God is supposed to do. And I really do believe that what, what you're saying really needs to be emphasized that if I'm, one of the favorite words of one of my mentors, uh, Dr. James Houston, has become a huge mentor of mine. He's 96 years old now, personal student of C.S. Lewis. Mm -hmm. He founded Regent College in Vancouver and he's been a tremendous mentor of mine. And he, he talks about the, the, one of the great struggles in modern Christianity is the impermeability. He likes these fancy words, that our souls are not permeable. There's a, a thick crust around our souls. And until we realize that's there and all these spirits gonna bust open that crust and speak into the deep part of us where we can say, God, your ways really are good. I'm not sure if I can figure them all out, but I can see something of what you're up to now. And I believe what, I, I'm a fan of C.S. Lewis and I love one of his phrases, that the entire purpose of the church is to produce little Christs. Mm -hmm. What God is doing is forming me into the image of Christ. I'm on the pains of childbirth, Paul said in Galatians 4, until Christ is formed in you. And is that my goal? 
And I got to challenge myself on that just about every day because in my flesh-driven nature, my entitled self, my goal isn't to become more like Jesus. My goal is to get my wife to keep on loving me, to get my kids to be godly like I want them to be, to get my grandkids all saved, and to get my books to sell, and to get my health to be good, and to get all sorts of other things. My goal really isn't to become a little Christ. Because if I want to become a little Christ, look what that means. Look what he did. He lived for, for 30 years without sinning once. He was a sinless son of God, the Lamb of God. Then he lives for three years, very popular at first, loses his popularity, and then he gets killed. And do I want to live like that for the glory of God to accomplish his purpose? And whatever God's purposes are, am I going to tremble when they don't make sense to me, but am I going to trust that they're good and then get whatever wisdom I can get that maybe he's up to forming me into the man that I most long to be. And the deepest thirst of my soul is not to have a good marriage. The, I want that, of course, and I do have it. I'm glad for it. But the deepest thirst of my soul is to bring pleasure to God, to delight God by becoming a little more like his son in the power of the Spirit. It's the loss of an awareness of that thirst that's getting in the way with a lot of people's growth in their Christian life. You write in the book about distort and deny the counterfeit gospel then and now and how in the story of Saul, Paul, Shaul, Rabbi Shaul, um, that the message was being distorted. There was uh, a spin on it that, that uh, was for the edification of maintaining the high rank and position and the control and the power and the economics and the finances and the status of the Pharisees. Uh, there were those like Nicodemus mm -hmm. who, who had the fortitude to break away mm -hmm. and ask the questions. Yeah. Uh, there were those that, that uh, believed that he was the Messiah and paid the price for it. Uh, but we also see today uh, a parallel. And we see Paul's letter to Timothy uh, with a warning and a, quite a stern one. And he said, if you hear a Jesus, and in the Greek it's, it says uh, uh, it's a word uh, for different that doesn't mean wholly different. It means different but similar. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it goes on to say, if you hear a Holy Spirit which is different and it's wholly different, and you hear a gospel which is different, which is wholly different, um, you, you, need, you need to really take a hard look at this and understand this warning and you need to call it out for what it is and, and get away from it because it's not what uh, this is this is an end time sign this is and and we're facing this today a, a biblical proportion this is being televised around the world and the truth of the gospel which is uh, there are there parts of the gospel which are chastening. There are parts of the gospel which are purely corrective. Uh, they yeah. are confrontational. And they, it's all good news, but we don't hear it as good news. Exactly. Yeah. So what do, what do we do in this section that you write on the story of Saul um, uh, about this counterfeit gospel? Where's the message? Because it doesn't make sense to me that anybody would take the most supernatural mm -hmm. and want to replace it with the sensational. Yeah, all right. That is the difference, isn't it? And um, I think one, as I look back on the, the, the genesis of this book, one of the reasons when I, that I wrote the book, maybe the, one, of the, one of the really driving reasons, was the number of people, the number of Christians who had been leading a nice, strong Christian life, church going, following the principles of the Bible and all the rest of it, and then abandoning their faith, moving away from God, or becoming just lukewarm, laid as sin, or becoming outright resistors, um, or developing a counterfeit gospel that says it, the, the, the gospel has to be different than, than what, how Jesus was talking about it in terms of trials and troubles and difficulties. The gospel has to be something that fits my understanding of what the word good actually means. And that's the counterfeit gospel for today. I remember talking to a, years ago I had a financial consultant who was telling me that um, the, um, there was a tremendous lawsuit against him that he knew was completely unjust, completely unfair. And he said, if there's a God in heaven, this will turn out the way I want it to be. 
that's a counterfeit sentence. Mm -hmm. If there's a God in heaven, of course my life will go the way I want it to go. A woman that worked for me for some years, her mother develops a disease and she prayed fervently and had hundreds of people praying that she would be restored to good health and she died and she gave up the faith. How could God do that? Because I have a counterfeit gospel that he's not providing. So either you have people who have a counterfeit gospel that the Bible isn't providing or a counterfeit gospel that we require the Bible to provide by distorting the message of the Bible. And I need to say, you know, when I, when I go to see my doctor wondering if I'm going to get good news or bad news, and one of the lines I use in the book that means a lot to me, uh, if I were to say to my wife, honey, I'm trusting God for good news today, that would be a very different sentence than saying I'm praying to God for good news today. It's legitimate to pray to God for good news, to, for good news, but I want to trust God for what He's up to, and it may not be good news for my doctor. It may be that difficult news is going to come that He's going to use in wonderful ways in my soul to get me more active for the larger story that He's telling, and to give me more power in writing a better book and counseling in a more effective way and being able to love better. But so I'm trusting God to do what He knows is good as opposed to trusting him to do what I think is good. And that's the counterfeit gospel that we so often get confused by. We're talking with Dr. Larry Crabb, author of the new book, When God's Ways Make No Sense. Uh, Philip Yancey says Larry Crabb is the ideal person to address this topic, and I think it's because of both your personal and your professional mm -hmm. existence before, during, and mm -hmm. During, yeah, uh, because right. the because the after hasn't <laughs> hasn't come yet. Uh, we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about when God's ways make no sense, because there is a high calling to trust. There is a high calling to long for God's provision, but are we approaching the throne the way God asked us to approach the throne? And are we using the tools that God has given us, which is a relationship with the Father, a relationship with the Son, and a relationship with the Holy Spirit? And are we using the full counsel of heaven the way God designed the full counsel of heaven to be used? We'll be right back. Back. Shalom. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, Executive Director of Ignatic Nation and host of the daily TV program Revealing the Truth seen live every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time at www.ianbn.com and then replayed throughout the day and night via our website. All of our segments can be seen on the Ignatia Nation YouTube channel. Since our launch in January of this year, we've expanded our global reach to over 54 countries with a social media following of over 125,000. Our commitment is to bring you the most in-depth interviews with authors, subject matter experts, and thought leaders from around the world. We have interviewed guests from Israel, Brazil, England, India, and all across North America. All of our authors are featured on the Books and Media page on our website, www.ianbn.com. There you can find a direct link to the book you want to order, and we receive a small commission directly from Amazon. There is no cost to you for this service. In addition to our daily teachings and interviews, we make available to you the archive of all of the interviews on our YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram channels. Our live program is available from our homepage, and there is never a charge to you for any of this access. We made the decision long ago that we would remain a commercial-free resource that would not be influenced by any pressure from any outside company. There are only two ways that we are able to continue to operate this ministry and provide you with the only live four-hour daily Christian television talk show program. The first is through your support and tax-deductible contributions to Igniting a Nation. These can be made directly through the donate button on the website or sent through the mail to Igniting a Nation, 2700 Corporate Drive, Suite 120, Birmingham, Alabama, 35242. The other way we support the program is by offering you a unique opportunity to have access to over 10 years worth of teachings on a subscription basis. 
The teaching archives contains all of my prior sermons, Torah studies, prophecy in the news videos, and much more for the low subscription price of $5 per month. This subscription grants you unlimited access to over 800 hours of content not available elsewhere and is updated weekly with the most current prophecy classes. In addition to 20 hours of original TV programming each weekday, we invite you to join us live every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday evenings for our Prophecy in the News classes. The times and locations are listed on our events page on the website www. Dot I-A-N-B-N dot com. Every day you and I are faced with the challenge of where we will go to hear the truth. We are committed to bring you the only program of its kind that covers the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. We cannot do this without your support. Since we launched on January 5, 2017, we have aired over 300 individual teachings, interviews, and commentaries not available anywhere else. We are now working side by side with almost every major Christian publishing house to bring you the most in-depth feature interviews possible. Our one-hour features address every subject that affects the believer's life. We are hearing of salvations from the Middle East, Africa, and all across the United States. Lives are being changed every day, and we have only just begun. Our mission is to become your trusted resource and grant you access to the people, tools, and information you need to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You can help us by liking us on social media and through your financial support. We know you have many choices in who you support, but we are prayerfully asking you to consider helping us keep revealing the truth, true to our calling, to cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth like no other program available. Donate today and help us bring the message to the four corners of the earth. Visit www.ianbn.com and donate, buy a book, or subscribe to our teaching archives. Without you, we do not exist. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're talking with Dr. Larry Crabb, author of the newly released book, When God's Ways Make no sense. Dr. Larry Crabb, welcome back to the program. Always good to be here. Uh, Dr. Crabb, God's ways in so many parts of our life just don't make sense. Uh, the person who looks at the 12 weeks of chemotherapy and they're put into a room with 12 other people, uh, 11 strangers, and they don't embrace that as an opportunity to talk to them about church or talk to them about the Lord, I see those as missed opportunities. Mm -hmm. They see that as, oh, well, I have to suffer through 12 hours of hanging a bag. I see that as a ministry divine appointment. Uh, I had a young man who's a friend of mine and Jason's was uh, helping uh, a friend of his on his motorcycle drive him home because the friend was less skilled a driver than than uh, our friend was, and they were driving at night, and his foot at 75 miles an hour hit a concrete embankment. Oh my! It could have easily ripped the foot right off the leg, and so when I went to see him in the hospital, and they told him that there's gonna be many reconstruction surgeries, I said the first thing I want to tell you is you have no idea what God has spared you from. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. This has been my message when I make a hospital visit. You have no idea what God has spared you from. And you will never know what God has spared you from. Now, that's when God's ways don't make sense. Is that how can I be laying here with my foot hanging on by a thread? They're talking about how they're going to have to bolt it on and, and, and wire it on and pin it on. And I'm here in excruciating pain. And your message is, is you have no idea what God spared you from. <laughs> Well, he could have lost that leg, mm. lost that foot. Infection could have set in. He could have died. He could have died and it could have killed his... Uh, so many scenarios that we just don't embrace the goodness and the glory of God. And it's time for us to reframe this. And I think what you've done is you've given us in this book the tools mm. to reframe the circumstances that we are prone to run from, deny, 
condemn, mm. um, renounce. Yeah, judge God as not being so good. All of those things. As you were writing this book, what were you hoping was going to be a response? I believe that I can look back on my life and I can see so many ways in which God has reframed my thinking and there's still a whole lot more to go. And I want to see other people uh, coming to grips with the reframing process that leads actually to joy and leads actually to a purpose for life and a way of trusting that God is good in the middle of tough things. And I've had to have it reframed. I can tell, tell you two quick stories as to how the reframing process has taken place that I hope this book will help others experience as well. My mother suffered from Alzheimer's, a seven-year battle, and by the time the battle was um, in its fullness, she was completely incoherent. And when I went, came to visit her in the unit she was in, she had no idea who I was. And I remember driving away from that, knowing how badly my father was hurting and losing his wife to Alzheimer's. And he said to me, is this the cruelest disease there could be? Because there she is, physically reasonably healthy, but has no idea who I am. When I put my arm around her, she doesn't know who's hugging her. And I would drive home, and I was angry. I got mad at God. And the, what I was saying, this is some years ago, God, if I had the power, I know what I'd do. I'd restore a mother's brain. I'd restore a mother's competency to be able to think and to reason well and to experience the joy of a husband's love. That's what I would do if I had the power to do it. And to give my dad the enjoyment of growing old with his wife that he loved so deeply, God, you have the power, you aren't doing it. I'm really struggling with you. Your ways are making no sense. You have the power, you're not using it for something that is unarguably, at least from my perspective, good. And the idea that there's going to be a deeper good even accomplished through this miserable experience was an entirely reframing thought for me eventually. One other quick example, when I was struggling with a serious disease with cancer, Jim Houston, one of my great mentors, Dr. Houston, wrote me a brief letter. It was the second best letter I've ever received. And he said, uh, Dear Larry, uh, how grievous to learn that your cancer has returned, but no doubt you've heard the words of Samuel Johnson that nothing quite clears the mind like a walk up the gallows. And I'm trusting that you will recognize how in your clearer mind about spiritual things, your power will be greater as years go by. That was reframing. Mm -hmm. And I've kept that letter. I have it, I, that's pretty well a quote because it meant so much to me. That was a reframing process. And I want people, if this book has any value at all to the God's purposes, then I'm praying that the Spirit will be using it to help people, I love your phrase, to reframe. The difficulties of life are not endpoints, they're opportunities, they're doors that are opening. And is it hard? Yeah, it's hard. Am I telling people, well, you shouldn't complain about it? Well, of course you shouldn't complain, but you have no choice but to hurt. You have no choice but to suffer. You have no choice but to wish it were otherwise. But in the middle of all of that, can you sit back and say, wait a minute, is there really a God who's telling a story that is really good? And does he have an end point here that one day I'll recognize satisfies the deepest thirst of my soul? And if I'm not in touch with my deepest thirst, then his ways are going to continue to make no sense and I'm going to be resisting him all the time. But if I get a hold, when Jesus said, John 7, anybody here thirsty? I think what he was saying is, I know you all are, mm -hmm. but anybody willing to agree with me that you're really thirsty and you're not getting your thirst satisfied by what you're going through now, I've got the answers to your deepest thirst. And until I get a hold of that, the reframing is not going to take place. Our tendency is fight or flight. Yeah. That's kind of what, what we've been programmed to think. I, I seem to feel that way at times mm -hmm. is, is that yeah. we, we have a, this. So you're not quite glorified yet. Not quite glorified yeah. yet. Uh, but my choice is to fight the spiritual battle. Uh, the dominion mandate. Yes. Um, usurped by Satan's lies but given back to me in Luke ten eighteen, where uh, Jesus said, uh, I've given you the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome the, all the power of the enemy, nothing whatsoever shall harm you. Um, I'm actually not smart enough not to believe that. <laughs> I'm not that well educated or that smart enough not to grab a hold of all this. So when we take a look at, at um, in your book, you talk about the high calling. And uh, is the high calling uh, too high? Is the, it feels is, that way at times. It, it, it does feel that way, but as you and I talked before, I can either say that God's thoughts are, are 
way too high and completely unobtainable or can I move closer and if I can move closer to the mind of God then I've come closer to the heart of God. And you have plenty of biblical support for that. Let less mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Um, you have Paul talking about the fight in Philippians. I've, I've fought the good fight. What is the good fight? He's introducing us to a battle. He's, he's, looking, he's looking to us to, to, to gird up our loins and to get moving along here and to actually fight the battle that is going to be a fight until we're with the Lord. And then it's perfect rest forever. Now it's tastes. Taste and see that the Lord is good until the day is coming when the hors d'oeuvres are done and we're eating the banquet. But until then, we've got to fight to fight. And you know, um, I wrote a book called A Different Kind of Happiness, and I wanted to call it Battle for a Better Love, mm -hmm. but the marketer said, Christians don't want to have a battle, so the title's not going to sell. And I capitulated, I suppose. I gave in to the, the um, uh, different kind of happiness. I'm not sure if I have regrets of that or not, but I do take away from it the lesson that the Western Christian world really doesn't want to fight the battle so much as simply to enjoy all that God has for us. Well, that's possible, but only through the battle, only through the fight. In the book, you talk about um, three parables uh, that really, in the natural, make no sense whatsoever. Uh, we've allowed uh, I have a phrase I use, and that is that um, we've become dependent on the commentators. In the South, a commentator is just an ordinary potato. <laughs> and uh, why would I want to take my teaching from a commentator uh, when I can take my teaching from God because God explains? Uh, but there's also some correction, there's some, ad, uh, some admonishment, and uh, I hear the words of Jesus saying to his disciples, are, are, are you so dull, how long will I have to put up with you? So mm -hmm. we keep thinking about this sweet, loving, tender Jesus, but you know, he had a threshold for tolerance of, uh, of, of wanting his disciples to grab a hold as he has the same frustrations with us at times when we refuse no. to grab a hold and we get caught up in the battle of are you his favorite, am I his favorite, does he like you better, uh, why is your ministry bigger than my ministry, all those things. Um, the takeaway, uh, Jonah knowing better by heading his own way but being spewed out before and an entire nation becomes saved. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a story that, that, that uh, are we understanding it the way God intends it? It's a, it's a story every child knows, but it is, to, for you to include it in here tells me already, and after having read it, of course, uh, there's much more depth. Oh, yeah. It's not just the story of Jonah and the whale. It's not that at all. It's, um, it, it's a parable. It really is a parable of, that we're supposed to take issue with, or, or supposed to agree with, and understand where Jonah was failing in that. And you know, Jonah, as um, some people, when I've taught on this, I realize a lot of Christians don't realize this, but, but earlier in 2 Kings, God had another job for Jonah before the book of Jonah's job, and that was to prophesy to Israel that they were going to do very, very well. Jonah loved that assignment, and he was a popular prophet. And there were some other prophets along during that day. Amos was close in time to that. Who was more popular, Jonah or Amos? And Amos was pretty hard uh, in his teaching. Right. And Jonah was saying, you're going to have a great life now. Who is more popular? No, now God's beloved children are having a really good time. And now God comes along and says, let me give the enemy of Israel, Babylon, uh, not Babylon, Assyria, Nineveh being the capital, they're the only really threat to your enjoyment of life right now. And their sin is so bad I want to destroy them. Let's go give them a chance to repent so I don't have to destroy them. And Jonah's response was, that makes no sense to me at all. And that was one of the first thoughts that I had as to what we need to think about there, that, um, that Jonah's response of when you make no sense, I'm not going to follow you. I'm going to resist you. I'm going to run away from you. And I'm going to do whatever I can to make my life continue to be as good as I want it to be on my terms. A lot of Christians do that today, and it's a terrible mistake. And that's parable number one, the life of Jonah. Is the clarion call, if, you, if God doesn't make sense to you, that's God taking you from darkness into light. 
the light switch is now being turned on saying you need to persevere and press in until it does make sense. Okay? That, that, that the old statement, uh, confessing that I have a problem is the, first, mm -hmm. is the first step towards healing. Confessing that this makes no sense to me is the first step to understanding. Yeah, and I think the understanding that we can come to is a clearer understanding of what we mean when we say God is sovereign. When we think of the word sovereign, a lot of Christians assume that sovereignty means that things are going to go well in my life because he's in control of everything. Now, if God is sovereign, and I believe he is, but my question is, he, he's, what is he in control of? He's in control of whatever he chooses to control because he is God. He can control whatever he chooses. But what he's sovereignly in control of is the story he's telling. And until we understand that God's sovereignty, and one of the things I develop in the book is my understanding, which I, I think I'm on to this, but I have a couple of questions about it still. Um, my understanding of sovereignty is that God is unthwarted in his sovereignty. Nothing can happen to me. A young gentleman on a motorcycle that almost loses his leg, did God sovereignly cause that? I have a hard time with that. I have a hard time with the idea that God sovereignly caused a neighbor of my wife when she was a little girl to molest her. Mm -hmm. God is not the author of sin. God doesn't cause sin. Does he allow sin? Of course he does. But he, he's given us freedom and we've abused the freedom time and time and time and time again. But nothing is going to happen that God cannot use for his purposes. My, my younger son, and I have permission to say this publicly, his first marriage failed. His wife left him. And he was so distraught. Um, I sat with him in front of our fireplace one evening after the divorce, and he was just weeping, saying, I never wanted this to happen, and she left me for somebody else, and it was terrible. And uh, I remember saying to him, as I held him in his tears, I said, son, God is never gonna allow anything to happen to you that he cannot use for a purpose you will one day celebrate. That's gonna require some faith for you now to believe in the middle of your pain. I wanna be with you in your pain. I'm not telling you to start feeling good. I'm not saying that my words are gonna make you sit up and wanna go out and play tennis right now, because they're not. All you wanna do is cry. Keep on crying as long as you want to, but do understand there's a story that's going on that you can't quite now see. But if you're willing to keep pursuing who God is, who died for you, the God who died for you, is he gonna withhold from you something good? There's gonna be something good that's gonna come out of this terrible difficulty in your life that is causing you so much pain. That's what I call unthwarted mm -hmm. sovereignty. And I hang on to that. And I believe that with all I my I think heart. we've forgotten a fundamental lesson. That the will of God will never lead you where the grace of God cannot keep you. I love that thought. That's exactly the case. And that's what I love about what it means to live the, what I'm now calling the in-between life between the cross and the coming. The coming, the knowledge, uh, I'm really involved in Second Peter right now in my own study time. And what Second Peter is saying after chapter 2, talking about all the false teaching that's coming into the church, and then Jude picks it up in his little epistle. And what, what Peter is saying, if you don't understand that the end is unbelievably good, you're not going to be able to survive the present. So if I want to live in between the, what the cross makes possible, knowing that it's difficult, but the prospect of the coming sustains me in all that the cross enables and requires me to live by. And I want to live that in between life between the cross and the coming. That matters the world to me, actually. A part of your overall message, book, ministry, is community. I've often said if you have to call yourself an Acts chapter 2 church, you're probably not one. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, we've lost a sense of community. And by losing a sense of community, we've lost a sense of common unity, which is what community is, a common unity. And that is our love of God, uh, a belief in the sovereignty of God, a belief in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and that Jesus died on the cross so that I might live forever and my sins would be forgiven. When we take a look at that whole picture, the picture becomes fractured because of denomination, because of doctrine, because of what man has done to distort. And I believe you bring a great deal of clarity mm. to some theological issues. Now, uh, you come across uh, as, uh, uh, from a counseling perspective, helping to lead, guide, and direct people in, through, and how to navigate out of 
circumstances which bring greater glory, greater opportunity, yes. greater blessings than you perceive on the front end as you're entering the top of the funnel uh, because you're the same size as when you exit the funnel. So imagine how much squeezing and pressure there must be to push you into that place. But as you bring us out of this funnel, it's not that you are going to have God make sense. Hmm. That's not what this is. This is not the handbook. Not on my for, terms. For, yeah, this is not the handbook for making sense of God. Mm -hmm. This is a handbook for understanding when God's ways make no sense that we need to look past the circumstance. We need to look past our perception and we need to stop for a moment and we need to relinquish our right, relinquish our pride, relinquish our assessment and say, Lord, erase the board, okay? The circumstances aren't gonna change, all right? But I want a clean slate in how you want me to approach, what you want me to glean from, what you want me to harvest from, and how you want me to come out the other side of this, okay? Now I'm a willing vessel. And this book takes me on the journey of how to become and understand how to be that willing vessel. Well, I think I know how I'm going to pray now for people who read the book, that they will read the book with the wisdom that you're bringing to it. Mm. I really appreciate your summarizing so much I want to say so well, and the emphasis on community. We really have trivialized community to where it's just a matter of, good to see you, how you doing? And we stop with that. We sit in a pew, we listen to hopefully a good sermon, maybe listen to serve, worship the Lord in music, which is wonderful, of course. But our community there is very little more than uh, nice to see you. And then we go out to lunch and watch a ball game. As opposed to saying, what do we really have in common that gives us a vision for each other that we can facilitate in each other by how we relate to each other? And if we do that in the middle of living with a God who doesn't make sense to us, maybe we're going to understand that his ways do make sense in a dimension that we have not yet fully understood what we long to, and his ways are always doing us good. He's always doing us good in the middle of all the difficulties of life. And his community having a vision for each other as to how we could come to believe that, encouraging each other with that vision of what we hold in common about the truth, uh, the three and three in one kind of a thing. When we understand that and start living that a little more and get into each other with, you know what I think is the lost art in the Christian church today is curiosity. Mm. You know, somebody says, I saw a good movie last night. Typical response is, I saw one too. As opposed to, which one did you see? <laughs> and why did you like it? We're not curious about each other. Well, I'm really hurting today. Well, just trust the Lord. You'll be, be okay. Tell me what you're hurting about. I want to know. Because when you go to the depths of what you're struggling with, you're going to find God there. And there's going to be a different reality developing in your soul if you're willing to face all the stuff that you're going through. But i got to know you well to know that. And I want to be interested in where you are and have a, a vision as I get curious about what's going on in your life. That's what I want to see happen. God cares. Even if it makes no sense to you. He's still loving us. He loves us. And even if you don't understand the message, your faith and trust in the messenger is what this book is about is if you will place your hope and trust in the one who sent his only begotten son and whose son said, I will send you someone when I leave you that will always be with you to help you navigate so that if you trust in the Holy Spirit and you read my word through the lens of the Holy Spirit and you communicate with me through the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, what makes no sense to you now will begin to make sense to you, maybe when you least expect it. I strongly encourage you, Dr. Larry Crabb, when God's ways make no sense, a read that will give you some understanding and will make sense to you as you walk this journey, not alone, but with a family of faith, people who care about you, a community that cares about you, and a loving God that will never leave you or forsake you. Dr. Larry Crabb, thank you so much for being with us here. My privilege entirely, Rabbi. Thank you, sir. Thank you, and God bless you. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we'll bring you the next edition of Revealing the Truth.